name is Elena Moreno. I'm the senior project manager for the Global HIV Enterprise at the International AIDS Society. It's my pleasure to open this webinar on a, and panel discussions on a, in a series on the experimental medicines for HIV preventative vaccines. This online seminar follows up on a first seminar that we discussed on experimental medicines and its challenges. Today, we will focus more on experimental medicines for HIV vaccine research development. I would like to welcome all participants and our panelists that will be introduced, introduced, introduced to you shortly. First, before we proceed, I would like to share a few rules for the webinar. Please note that we are uh, all participants are muted. If you have any questions, you can always use the questions and answer box that you have at the bottom of your screen. If you have any question that is not related to the, to the topic today, we will encourage you to use our email. I will send you the email address in the chat later. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can always, always use the chat box. So I'm now handing over to Susan Buchbinder, who is the director of, the, of their Bridge HIV and HIV Prevention Research Unit at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and is clinical professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics at UCSF, and who introduced today's webinar. Welcome, Thank you so much, Elena. Um, on behalf of the Global Vaccine Enterprise and the International AIDS Society, I wanna welcome you to the second in a two-part series on experimental medicine for HIV vaccine research. Now, as Elena mentioned, the first webinar covered what experimental medicine vaccine, what experimental medicine trials are in general, as well as some of the major challenges. And if you missed seeing the webinar, you can find it on the Global Vaccine Enterprise website under the events tab. It's really well worth watching. What we're gonna to do today is to dig into some specific examples of experimental medicine trials and discuss how they may contribute specifically to HIV vaccine science. So the question arises, why now? Why are we turning to experimental medicine for HIV vaccines? So experimental medicine is not a new concept, although our focus on experimental medicine and HIV vaccine science is relatively new. And that's because we're at a crossroad of sorts in the HIV vaccine research. So on the one hand, we've had some recent disappointments from large scale efficacy trials, the HVTN 702 and Imbocoto trials that were conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa and were testing the hypothesis that non-neutralizing antibodies can protect against HIV acquisition. We still have one related uh, efficacy trial in the field, the Mosaico trial, which is testing whether an AD26 mosaic vaccine in combination with a bivalent GP140 protein vaccine can protect against uh, HIV acquisition among men who have sex with men and transgender individuals in North and South America and Europe. Unlike the Imbocoto trial, the Mosaico trial is using a mosaic protein boost and is being tested against a, in a different population with a different route of transmission, different clade, a different estimated HIV incidence rate than the Imbocoto trial. And the Mosaico trial is fully enrolled and we're just awaiting efficacy results. But in the meantime, we've had two proof of concept studies, the AMP trials, that demonstrated the uh, proof of principle that passively administered broadly neutralizing antibodies can provide protection against HIV infection when the virus is sensitive to neutralization. And we have a number of hypotheses about how to in induce neutralizing antibodies through vaccination, through active immunization, and new tools and new platforms and technologies to probe these hypotheses. But we know that the pace of HIV vaccine development has been too slow. We've seen what focused research can accomplish with development of COVID vaccines, and we need the same sense of urgency in developing an HIV vaccine. So we've turned to experimental medicine to accelerate the pace of testing these hypotheses about induction of neutralizing antibodies. These experimental medicine trials, as you'll learn from the upcoming talks, are really testing hypotheses rather than developing products per se. The trials allow for rapid iteration to get us to a deeper understanding of how to develop effective HIV vaccines. 
what we're going to do is we're going to start with five talks that are will be quite brief on some experimental medicine trials and perspectives on how experimental medicine trials may contribute to vaccine science. And then we'll move into the panel discussion. Due to time constraints, we won't take questions after each of the talks, but please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we can during the panel discussion. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers and panelists for today's session. We have Professor William Sheaf, who's Professor of Immunology and Microbiology at the Scripps Research Institute in California and Director of Vaccine Design at the International Vaccine, uh, AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Dr. Ansuya Naidu is Medical Director at the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Professor Robin Shattuck is the Head of Mucosal Infection and Immunity within the Department of Medicine at Imperial College London. Dr. Brett Leave is Vice President in Clinical Development and Public Health Vaccines at Moderna in Boston, Massachusetts. Professor Ann Arvin is a Senior Vice President for Research at Veer Biotechnology in San Francisco, California. And then joining our panel will be Stacy Hanna, Director of Research Engagement at AVAC and Project Director for the Coalition to Accelerate and Support Prevention Research, also known as CASPER, whose primary mission is to build an African-led movement to support HIV prevention R&D. And then Dr. Jim Kublin, who's Executive Director of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network in Seattle, Washington. Our chair for today's panel session will be Dr. Nina Russell, who's Director of HIV Prevention and Tuberculosis at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm now gonna hand things over to Professor Bill Sheaf, who will provide the first presentation, which is entitled, An Overview of IAVI G001, G002, G003, and HVTN302. Bill. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me to be here. Yeah, so I'd like to just talk to you about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the clinical trials that we're working on with our colleagues, um, experimental medicine trials to try to figure out how to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV. And this talk involves lots and lots of other collaborators and is really short, so I'm not even gonna specifically acknowledge other individuals, but you know that there's lots of people out uh, working on this. <clears throat> so our, <clears throat> The basic strategy that we're pursuing is called germline targeting vaccine design. And the idea is that the vaccine needs to elicit plasma cells that secrete broadly neutralizing antibodies at high titer and for long periods to protect against HIV. Uh, but to get there, um, we believe you have to develop a vaccine that will train the, that train the immune system to produce these plasma cells very efficiently. And that starts with a germline targeting priming immunogen to activate appropriate naive B cells that have the genetic and structural potential to develop into BNAB secreting cells. And <clears throat> if you can make that priming immunogen work, generate a, a pool of memory and germinal center B cells that could then be boosted uh, to gain additional maturation, additional somatic heart mutation uh, by shepherding, boosting or shepherding immunogens. And there could be multiple of those in series. And at the end, uh, we envision a polishing immunogen that would uh, trigger the final pool of memory and germinal center B cells and, and optimally create this large pool of plasma cells that are in your bone marrow and that would be secreting broadly neutralizing antibodies. And what I'm going to talk about today is mostly around this first clinical trials where we've just finished and <clears throat> that we're doing now to test this first step and a little bit this, this step, and then one clinical trial testing sort of a platform technology. So IAVI G001 was a first in human test of germline targeting, and it used a germline, a self assembling nanoparticle on a strong adjuvant. And the clinical trial ran from September 2018 to March 2020 at the Fred Hutch and GW Washington and GWU. And the primary endpoint was safety and tolerability, but the major immunological endpoint was to find out if the vaccine could induce VRCO1 class IgG B cells. Um, and the critical readout was by B cell sorting and B cell receptor sequencing at the VRC and the Fred Hutch. So this is highly experimental medicine style. Um, this is really looking under the hood to find out, okay, if you give one or two shots of a vaccine, what kinds of B cells did you just turn on? Are they exact, do they have exactly the kinds of sequences, those B cell receptors, do they have exactly the kinds of sequences 
that you intended to, to in, elicit? And do you do it in everybody in the trial? And how frequent are they in everybody in the trial? And how mutated are they? So we really needed to look in detail. And all that came from this assay that was set up by um, uh, Adrian McDermott and Rick Kalp at the VRC and Kristen Cohen and Julie McGrath and Fred Hutch and their teams. So, uh, you know, beautiful work there. We had, um, in this clinical trial, we had two groups, um, low dose and high dose. In each case, there are 18 vaccine recipients and six placebo recipients. And the design of 18 was Alan uh, DeCamp at, at uh, the VISC and I worked a lot on how big the trial needed to be. And um, it, it's, it's, I think it's a very important issue in experimental, experimental medicine trials. We, we thought about, well, what's the readout that we're going for and what sensitivity do we need? And we thought we needed 18. I don't have to go into the details, but it's something that people should think about. I don't think you should automatically just do trials with group size of 10 uh, because the statistics don't, are not very good for a group size of 10. Um, so the abbreviated findings, um, just really quick, uh, the, the vaccine was safe and well tolerated. Um, it induced very strong responses to the CD4 binding site. After one or two injections, um, 0.06 to 0.42% of IgG memory B cells in PBMCs were CD4 binding site specific. So for any, for any sort of uh, vaccine technology, if you're trying to induce responses to a particular epitope, you know, these would be good numbers just generically, although this doesn't tell us that there was BRCA1 class B cells in there yet. Um, but by the sequences, by sequencing the B cells that were CD4 binding site specific, we found out that the, the vaccine induced a VRCA1 class responses, which had a VH12 heavy chain and a five amino acid LCDR3 um, in 94 to 97% of the vaccine recipients, 94% after one shot and 97% after two. So that was really a key finding in exactly what we were going for. Um, and in those individuals that produced a VRCA1 class response, it was actually a very strong response. So the frequency of those B cells in each individual was very high, reaching a, reaching a peak of 0.1% of IgG memory B cells. So, you know, one in a thousand of a person's uh, B cells in the periphery were VRCA1 class, which I found to be remarkable. And we also found that the second shot induced increased mutation levels and increased affinities. We made the antibodies that we had induced and we measured their affinities. So all of that kind of thing, I think, is stuff you would do in, a, in an experimental medicine trial. And, and we, in the field, we as a whole, we need to do that a lot more to, we believe, to walk toward making an HIV vaccine rather than just trying to make something that will just solve the problem right away because it's such a hard problem. Uh, and finally, so the post-vaccination antibodies that we isolated, uh, we could use them to help select the boost candidate. As I mentioned, this is just testing the priming stage. Now we need to know what do we do, what, what immunogen would be optimal to, to trigger this memory pool and continue the maturation going onward. So you can see that in this sort of sequential vaccine strategy, you need a bunch, you need a sequence of different clinical trials to figure out how to get this to work and optimize it. And we're fortunate that this first one worked for us, but it might not have. But even if it didn't, that wouldn't mean we should just go home. It would mean we should look under the hood what happened and try to figure out, okay, if we tweaked it, could we revise it and make it work better? And that would all be under the guise of experimental medicine. Um, so with the idea that we need to do a lot of uh, uh, um, sequential human clinical trials, um, we have been working with Moderna on their, you know, on collaborating to use their mRNA technology for quite a while. And here's the reason why. So to develop a highly effective HIV vaccine, we will need to carry out many iterative human clinical trials. If we rely on GMP protein manufacture, which takes two or three years from my experience, or could be, could be longer to make a single protein to give to a human, if we rely on that, our progress will be limited by the slow pace and high cost of manufacture. It's also really expensive. So it just bogs down the field like crazy. The solution we're, hope, we're hoping, we're hopeful that Moderna mRNA will provide a rapid economical and highly immunogenic vaccine platform to enable expeditious iterative human vaccine testing. We just need to be able to go into the clinic as soon as we believe we have something justifiable to test in humans and it, we think it's gonna be safe. We need to go in there and find out and, and iterate because it's gonna take many trials to make an HIV vaccine. And we just the, the rapid development and high efficacy of the Moderna mRNA COVID vaccine bodes well for our work together. Um, and so I think this is my last slide. Um, what are we doing now? So building on the success of G001, that's just one step, right? It doesn't guarantee we're gonna make a vaccine. We have a long way to go. We're carrying out um, IAVI G002 
and the immunizations actually just started in January of this year, uh, which is an IAVI Moderna and Gates Foundation partnership to test mRNA, mRNA delivered GTA prime and a first boost. So we wanna know if we do this via R, if we try to redo G001 using RNA, do we get basically the same result or as good of a result? And can we go one step further? Can we deliver a first boost and further cause increase of maturation? And can we do it in all the people that we vaccinate? Um, and so that's the reason that we could come in with this core boost so quickly, we haven't even published the results of G001 yet, is entirely due to the fact that we got data early from the, from the experimental medicine approach. We were getting sequences in the middle of the trial and making antibodies in the middle of the trial, testing them, informing in mouse experiments that helped us decide what our core boost should be. And then we got permission from the Gates Foundation and Moderna to yes, go ahead, let's make your core, let's make your prime and your core boost and get a clinical trial started. So that's the idea that you know we, and I think everyone in the field would like to do with the experimental medicine approach. We need to do smart, but very as quickly as possible, get things into human and, and do more experiments. And we're also doing IAVI G003, which Ansui will talk about in more detail, but <clears throat> that's gonna open in, in May or June. Um, and it's testing, uh, it's a very large partnership with PEPFAR and Advance partners um, and Moderna to test mRNA delivered EODGTA in Africa, where you know, the vaccine is most needed and, and, and collaborating with African scientists to really do, uh, to, to, to do the analysis uh, and a lot of the trial planning. So that's exciting. And Ansu is gonna talk about IAVG003. And then I mentioned platform technology. So in, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna develop a sequence of immunogens that elicits broadly neutralizing antibodies, we're gonna need to deliver HIV trimer spikes stabilize HIV trimers. And, you know, Rohir Sanders and John Moore led the way in developing SOSIP and everyone after them is, you know, adding features onto that or making alternates. But the idea is that we're gonna need uh, stable trimers. So kudos to them. And what we're asking here is if we're gonna be using RNA as a technology and we're gonna deliver vaccine sequences, we're gonna need RNA to deliver stabilized HIV trimers. Um, and <clears throat> what we're asking in this trial is, do you, is it better to deliver a soluble trimer launched by RNA or a membrane bound trimer launched by RNA? Or in one thing that's particularly needs, needs to be tested in humans is the trimer, it binds, it, it binds human CD4. It's, it's evolved to do that. That's how HIV enters cells, but that might have a negative effect on vaccines. And so we're testing also a membrane bound trimer with a mutation that blocks CD4 binding to see if that might um, improve uh, vaccine responses. So in this trial, we're not looking to induce BNABs. We're not actually looking to induce any particular class of, BNAB, of antibodies. We just want to find out what's the best way in humans to deliver a native HIV trimer and then with RNA. And then we're going to use that information in our subsequent uh, work on developing sequential vaccines. So very experimental, exper experimental medicine style. Um, and I mentioned there's, you know, obviously tons of people involved in this, and I don't have time in the short talk to review all the people, but these are all the institutions, and I, I think I mentioned uh, all of them as we went along. So I'll stop there and say thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, that was an incredibly clear uh, presentation. Um, next, we have Dr. Ansuya Naidu, who's going to be talking about IAVI G003, experimental medicine in the African context. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Ansuya Naidu, and I'm medical director with IAVI here in South Africa. I'm going to try and share this slide set, and hopefully it's going to work. There we go. So thank you once again, and uh, thank you both for uh, mentioning IRV G003. I'll be talking about it and how we plan to carry out this experimental trial in Africa, and in the hopes really to expand germline targeting as a program to Africa. Um, as always, IRV remains uh, grateful to the support provided by our donors. So as you saw earlier in Bill's presentation, IRVG003 forms part of the germline targeting program. And the aim is to induce the maturation of VRCO1 class responses in humans. And with an added aim of evaluating these responses in African populations, and then assessing whether there are differences between the US populations being enrolled in IRVG002 and the African populations included in G003. 
So what is our main value proposition when conducting a trial of this nature, experimental medicine, as we're discussing in the African context? And I'm very pleased to see that there's a lot of our um, participants joining us from Africa who would have a vested interest in this. Um, of course, it is integral to expand the germline targeting approach within our African clinical research center networks. And then also to be able to bring early trials to the relevant populations, which will then support the further development of the molecule. So using the data from these trials to support the development of the molecule and the vaccine eventually. And a very important aspect to us and to the African trial centers is to conduct these trials and prepare sites to be able to conduct further trials in the future. And I will discuss this a little more later as we go on. So Bill mentioned IRVG001, and how do we plan to go beyond this um, within the African per, uh, perspective? It's widely accepted that African populations, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, will have the greatest need for an HIV vaccine. So it's imperative to include these populations in the development process. And first and foremost is to ensure the relevance of the immunogens in the African context. So we need to consider host factors like genetics and the environment. How would this impact our study? Things like nutrition, prevalence of endemic diseases like TB, malaria, schistosomiasis, to name a few. And then to understand how they may impact the frequency of VRCO1 precursors in our populations. For example, will these infections impact the immune response to a vaccine? These are questions that remain to be answered. Of course, the biggest challenge is still the enormous diversity of HIV, such that it is critical that we continue to carefully monitor circulating strains in the African population to anticipate the emergence of resistance. And then there's the feasibility of conducting these trials. So both now and in the future throughout Africa. And that is really a lot of what I will focus on uh, as we keep talking, establishing and building on existing clinical capacities to perform these novel sampling methods within these trials, uh, some of which are ultrasound guided, fine needle aspiration, leukophoresis, and even beyond that, to building research capacities to be able to analyze the samples that we are collecting in the trial. What will IRVG003 look like? It is a first in Africa phase one study to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of the EOD GT86 tumor, which Bill has just described, in African populations, where, as I mentioned, there is the greatest need for a vaccine. It will recruit for 18 participants who will be dosed at weeks zero and week eight, and then be followed up for six months after the second uh, dose of uh, investigational product. We have been able to develop this trial rapidly due to the speed and cost advantages associated with using uh, Moderna mRNA as our platform. So briefly, I will go through the objectives and endpoints. As you can see, safety and immunogenicity responses are key in this phase one study, as well as our social behavioral research component. If we look at the endpoints, I think it's clear that the focus on safety and tolerability is central and we will be assessing reactogenicity as well. And then beyond regular safety evaluations, we will also be looking at adverse events of special interest and medically attended adverse events. In terms of immunogenicity, we want to look at the specific antibody response to the antigens after each dose. Our exploratory endpoints cover the B cell response and in particular, the frequency of the VRCO1 class memory B cells after immunization. We have made sure to include social behavioral components in our exploratory endpoints so we don't lose track of this as the trial develops. Here we have the overall timeline for the trial, including the specific procedures that will be used. There are a few key examples that will be taken. So peripheral blood mononuclear cells will be collected at five time points throughout the trial, as you can see by the pink bars here. Uh, this will be repeated in Rwanda at the five time points. However, in South Africa, leukophoresis will be done at week 16 instead of a large blood draw. Now, in this case, our Rwandan site does not have any capacity to perform leukophoresis at this time, uh, nor the ability to perform it. And in South Africa, this will be a capacity building process with a local provider who will be doing this leukophoresis. 
Now, we acknowledge that the lack of leukophoresis at all sites may limit options for assay cross-validation within uh, the trial uh, with IRPG002 being done in the US. And this is part of our capacity building pro um, objectives. Fine needle aspirations, the green bars, will be done at weeks three and weeks eight of lymph nodes, and the analysis of the samples taken will also be done at African sites. Uh, here I've got a little bit on in terms of the procedures being done, uh, fine needle aspiration, which some of you may be familiar with, and then leukophoresis uh, will also be a developmental opportunity for researchers in these centers. So as we go on, this shows the location of our trial sites. In South Africa, we have the Orem Institute in Tembisa. And in Rwanda, we have the Center for Family Health Research in Kigali. If we then look at the analysis of the samples we are taking, you will see that we have labs in different parts of the continent who will be involved both in Kenya and in South Africa. Previously, what would happen is we would have to ship samples from Africa to the US or to Europe. Uh, but now we're setting up the capacity to do complicated B cell analysis within Africa. And the samples remain on the continent to be processed here. So this capacity building and training has already started uh, where we have been using G001 samples to prepare for G003. Uh, there is an element in the trial to send some samples to our partners working on G002 in the USA. Now they have a little more experience with this and this will also help to compare the samples coming out of Africa. So just as an example from Kenya, the team who will be doing the B cell sorting and sequencing, they have already received and set up the 10X sequencing platform. And this cutting edge technology allows multi-cell sequencing and higher throughputs. And one of the exciting things for us is that our local teams are so engaged and they're really excited to be involved in this type of science. They have embraced the opportunity and already we have seen uh, another example of where our lead scientist has grown as a result of working on the study and has seen the impact on her own career. Our African teams are also involved in establishing and qualifying these clinical assays. Now this has never been done in the African context before and has also been a development experience for the teams involved. As scientists are not always involved in clinical assay qualification, and this will surely be leveraged in the future, we believe, as they will now be recognized as expert labs running these assays for clinical trials going forward. And I don't want to forget something I mentioned earlier, which is the socio-behavioral research aspect. So in helping us to prepare for this, we held seminars with local ethics committees and regulators in East and Southern Africa to discuss the new sampling techniques <clears throat> used in our trials. And we wanted to get their feedback on issues to consider with the use of these techniques in African trials. And here you'll see some of the uh, thoughts that came up. I've split them into two major, group, major groups, focusing on clinical concerns and then ethical concerns. I think the list of clinical concerns is valid and these are all things we are aiming to address. More interesting in this slide is the list of ethical concerns, uh, which is particular to our environment. So in particular, participant education and sensitization. There was a feeling that most trials do not invest enough in this, and this can lead to problems downstream. For example, having a participant hooked up to a leukophoresis machine for 1.5 hours. We need to ensure they understand clearly what the procedure is, what the impact will be on them, and the benefit from a scientific perspective of what we are doing. Otherwise, this can cause hesitation to participate, especially if they get questions from friends and family within the community, asking them what is being put into them, what is being taken out of them. And this is really important for us in the context of the G003 trial. Um, I think this is my last slide before I thank our collaborators who have worked with us on this project, as well as uh, uh, mentioning our donors once again. And to close off, just reiterate how excited we are at IAVI to be able to uh, roll out this trial, IAVI G003, at our African sites. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Ansuya. That was a wonderful uh, and compelling case that you made for why we need to be doing these trials in uh, Sub Saharan Africa as well. Um, our next speaker is Professor Robin Shattuck, who's going to be speaking about clinically informed vaccinology 
is timely iteration possible? Thank you, and uh, hello to everybody who is uh, listening today. Um, I thought that what I would do with my presentation is really ask the question as to what might be possible to do timely iteration of clinical vaccine trials um, to ask whether it's possible to accelerate the approach that we currently use for vaccine development. And when I talk about experimental medicine trials, really what I'm referring to are clinical investigations of vaccine uh, immunogens or vaccine approaches where the trial provides no direct prophylactic or therapeutic benefit to the participant. Now often, as you've heard from the previous two uh, speakers, these are conducted as traditional phase one trials. Um, this is not necessarily always the case. And you'll recognize from the two previous presentations that still the current paradigm is that a phase one trial's primary uh, endpoint is safety and tolerability, and the secondary endpoint is the scientific endpoint. Whereas uh, for many of these trials, really what we're most interested in, uh, in approaching or, or solving is the scientific question um, and the safety uh, endpoints are really secondary, even though there should be no compromise in terms of the safety or the risk to the participants. So let's look at the current paradigm of uh, developing a vaccine and iteration. If we think about the approach, one needs to first of all design the immunogen or the vaccine candidate, produce that, get the re relevant regulatory and ethical approvals before moving into a clinical evaluation Conducting that clinical evaluation, collecting the relevant samples, completing the full immunological evaluation before you can come back to a second iterative round of design. And you've heard from Bill, if you're really smart, you may be able to be designing as you're uh, accruing the immunological analysis. Now, this pathway is only relevant if one needs to improve on the approach before moving into uh, classical phase one to for product development. And increasingly to de-risk this product development pathway, we see that there is a need to understand core scientific questions relating to HIV vaccine discovery. That doesn't mean that some uh, products may still merit going straight into a traditional phase one to four pipeline. Well, you've already heard some examples in terms of the time scale for this type of iteration. The design process can often take months. Um, we've heard in terms of recombinant proteins, this is often a 12 to 24 month uh, cycle for making uh, recombinant proteins. Regulatory approvals can often take many months. Um, and clinical evaluation classically for a phase one is a minimum of 12 months in order to get 12 months uh, safety uh, data from that clinical candidate. And then immunological analysis with all the bells and whistles can often be prolonged before a final clinical study report is uh, documented and submitted. And so you can see that the uh, typical iterative round of phase one trials is of average about three years which is clearly not fast enough to uh, have uh, a wide range of iterative cycles. And I've used this just as a model, and, and all models uh, can be criticised, but really just to get some points across. If we think of a three-year cycle and look at the potential of doing a germline strategy through iteration, the first cycle looking at engaging the germline precursor, then looking perhaps at two rounds of shepherding and polishing before you finally come to your fourth round of being honing down on an approach of a series of immunogens that lead to uh, uh, the induction of uh, broadly neutralizing antibody responses. You can see that getting into a phase uh, one to four program then leads to a very long timeline with a vaccine finally realized um, after a considerable time period. Now this assumes that, that through each iterative cycle there is success and not uh, a, a setback requiring another round of iterative iteration. And it's also modeled on a single monoclonal pathway. So for example, looking for a, a VRCO1 type pathway, um, rather than looking at several 
uh, monoclonal pathways that may be required to be solved to realize the level of breadth and redundancy so that the virus can't uh, break through um, as it might with a single epitope focused vaccine. Well, um, we looked at the timelines in our European project um, for trying to reduce uh, the cost and time for making recombinant proteins. We started off with a 24 month cycle. We worked extremely hard at making phase appropriate uh, lots using 25 wave, 25 litre wave bags, um, working with our partner Polymune in Austria, um, managed to reduce this down to about 15 months. Uh, we've made eight new uh, native light trimers manufactured over a period of 48 months. Um, and we're able to use these supported by a single pivotal toxicology study then to seed into a, a number now of experimental medicine trials. These are by and large not phase one trials. Um, these are trials that uh, have uh, ethical approval but haven't required regulatory oversight in the UK um, in the UK regulatory environment. But clearly that's not fast enough. So how could that be changed? Well, you've heard Bill already talk about RNA. Um, in terms of the RNA approach, vaccine design can be very quick. GMP manufacture can be a period of a few months or less. Um, and you'll hear later from uh, Moderna about uh, this type of approach. Obviously that represents one example. There are other providers of RNA technology and the numbers are increasing uh, almost on a weekly basis. So what do we actually need to be able to make uh, iterative, uh, timely iterative clinical trials? Well, obviously phase appropriate manufacture, both in terms of scale and timelines, um, appropriate regulatory pathways, experienced ethical bodies that are used to, to looking at clinical trials focused on experimental questions rather than product development, the ability to uh, have adaptive trial design and change those designs uh, as uh, the trials take place, um, appropriate safety evaluations that are appropriate to the phase of development, uh, trial participants that are motivated and understand that, the, the, that being part of the project will not bring them any direct, uh, direct benefit, very key and already highlighted by Bill Sheath in, the, in his talk, having it focused on scientific endpoints that address key scientific hypotheses. And then uh, to have time sensitive evaluation analysis, um, minimization of those stop start cycles that are often uh, the case with either grant funding or manufacturing cycles um, and a dedicated team experienced to manage experimental medicine trials. So how can that be changed? Well, I've already talked a little bit about changing the technology, um, the technology around protein manufacturing to some of the new technologies where time can be gained. Appropriate regulatory pathways Using platform technology often allows uh, a pivotal uh, uh, preclinical toxicology package to then support trials of multiple immunogens using the same platform. Obviously, this uh, saves a, a significant amount of time going forward. Those experienced review boards, uh, and particularly in certain countries, this allows to move farther faster because it doesn't require regulatory oversight and can be done outside of a traditional phase one for, uh, for, for non-clinical trial investigative medicinal products. Again, adaptive trial design. So uh, trial designs that actually incorporate a series of studies where uh, different immunogens can be brought in at different times in different combinations uh, with the flexibility to amend the trial uh, during that time period. And this is an approach that we uh, have adopted for the EV2020 trials, where we uh, submitted a trial design that included, uh, I think, three separate trials and about 21 different trial groups over a period of three years. Phase appropriate so safety evaluation in terms of rather than trying to have a, a phase one safety evaluation, only collecting the data that's necessary to ensure the safety of the product. 
and then rolling recruitment, screening and media outreach uh, ongoing throughout the program where the participants are seen as research partners and also advocates for bringing others into the clinical trial program. And then uh, in terms of addressing scientific, uh, addressing scientific endpoints where the focus is around answering the specific question rather than applying every immunological analysis that's currently available and taking every sample that is possible. So fixing the, the anal uh, analytical plan and the sampling to the scientific question ensuring that there is the technology there to provide uh, evaluation and analysis in a very time sensitive manner to avoid those stop start cycles and to have that dedicated team. So what could that actually realize in practice? Well, if we think about technology like RNA, uh, probably two weeks for the design, up to two months for the production, one month for the approval, six months for the clinical evaluation, and then coming out with an endpoint. That's reducing that cycle down to 12 months. Now, of course, there may be clinical questions that require significantly longer than 12 months to resolve, but I'm using this again as a model based on the lineage design type of approach. And here you can see significant gains in time, significant gains in getting into a phase one to four, and, and a much early delivery of, uh, of an effective vaccine. Now, of course, this is modeled on a single monoclonal pathway. It would make no sense to do this in series, but actually to have multiple trials addressing multiple pathways at the same time. And this now is possible to deliver um, either through parallel trials at a single site or multi-sites using a common protocol and, and common oversight. So the technology is now there to be able to deliver iterative trials um, and really the onus is on the community now to try and adopt this type of approach and speed up the timelines in order to achieve an effective vaccine in a meaningful timescale. Uh, I hope that that's uh, been informative and at the very least will stimulate discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Robin. That was really uh, very enlightening to see how we might actually really speed up the, uh, the pace of HIV vaccine science. Our next uh, speaker is going to be Professor Ann Arvin, who's going to be talking about the VIR 1111 study. Okay, I think you can see my slides. And let me begin by thanking um, the organizers for the opportunity to present Veer's work in um, HIV vaccine development and uh, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their partnership. If I may um, present this legal disclaimer on behalf of the company um, for your background and um, proceed to tell you about um, Vera 1111. I think Vera 1111, as you'll see, is a good case study in experimental medicine, developing a new viral vector for um, clinical purposes. And the elements I list here are the, um, those that go in to developing this kind of a program, what we know about the human biology, in this case of the viral vector, uh, what are the characteristics that support using, in this case, human CMV as a viral vector, animal model studies that are important background, and then phase one trial design. Um, quickly, the human CMV virus, um, as you know, probably is a human herpes virus. It is usually asymptomatic as an infection in the healthy host, has a latency uh, profile, in, reactivates intermittently, and overall has a high prevalence rate in the global population. So this is a vector that's going into, in most cases, um, people who are immune to um, the natural virus. The um, characteristics of CMV as a vaccine vector, this is a science that I would say underlies the known science that underlies moving forward with this vector. First of all, our properties of the genome, um, especially that it can accommodate inserting foreign genes and express those proteins stably. 
That's also accompanied by the fact that many HCMV genes are dispensable for replication. You can make the virus uh, in tissue culture because of um, that fact, scientific fact. Um, and at the same time, there is potential for attenuation if you mutate um, certain of those genes. Finally, a prediction persistence in the host. The other thing is the unique characteristics of CMV immunity which uh, is known to create very high levels of CD4 and CD8 memory T cells, predominantly effector memory T cells. And this um, creates a vaccine a vector that is uh, T cell focused in um, uh, proposed mechanism of action. The other indispensable part of this program is the immunobiology of rhesus CMV, which in work done by Klaus, um, Fru and Lewis Picker at OHSU has shown that if you do insert foreign DNA as shown in the schematic on the left into the rhesus CMV genome, you can immunize the animals and um, with selected modification of the, v, of the CMV genome, you can induce a special class of T cells that are seeing the antigen through an MHCE restricted um, response. And when they have looked at this um, vector in rhesus using SIV challenge and an SIV antigen insert, they can identify protection in um, uh, at least half of the animals that are studied. And that protection depends on this special property of the um, T cell response. So what is BR1111? It's a prototype vector. It expresses um, clade A HIV gag, and it's in a back backbone, which we call VIR2, and that has genetic modifications that are modeled from the rhesus studies that I just mentioned. Trial objectives, again, primary in the introduction of this new vector are safety, reactogenicity, and tolerability, starting with seropositive volunteers, and secondarily, the immunogenicity of the um, uh, response to um, the vector. Here is a little more detail about the design of the VIR 1111 prototype. I've listed um, the on the left the gene modifications that have been made to the backbone, and those are also, as you can see, in the case of UL82, that is where we put the GAG. So the GAG gene is expressed by the human CMV UL82 promoter. The other modifications recapitulate those that were made in rhesus CMV and that show um, the readout in rhesus of the uh, T cell response. These gene changes also modify expectations about cell tropism and um, growth restriction. These are predicted effects in vivo, just to underline the fact that we need to do clinical trials because in, you cannot predict those in vitro functions will necessarily translate to an in vivo readout. Quickly then the trial design, multiple ascending dose um, escalation is necessary in this context for an experimental medicine trial. You notice in the bottom, the highlight of leukophoresis. I think we've heard before that it's very important to be able to have sufficient sample to understand in detail the immune response that's being elicited. Um, so, Let's see, here's a, a quick look at the schedule of assessments, again, emphasizing safety assessments. And in the case of a viral vector, of course, one of those is testing to see whether the vector is modified from the, um, the modifications to the genome in terms of its interaction with the host for viremia um, and viral shedding, as well as the typical safety labs. Immunogenicity analysis, um, to emphasize again, as has already been mentioned, in this kind of a study, we need to have very exact uh, and precise immunologic readouts. And so I've just listed those that we are looking at in this study, focused on the T cell responses, but also looking at serology to GAG and the importance of the leukophoresis samples to um, 
really drill down on the um, T cell response, what is the nature of the antigen presentation and TCR recognition, um, eventually what um, are the capacities of these T cells to, um, to recognize HIV infected cells. And the other thing I want to really highlight in this slide is the number of collaborators and partners and the importance of the infrastructure that's been um, made um, uh, available to do these kinds of studies. And that um, those are the um, collaborative um, centers that are listed on the right, as well as the OHSU Vaccine and Genetic Therapies Institute. Um, finally, um, this uh, summarizes our, our VIR 1111 trial. The goal is to determine the proof of biology, the safety and immunogenicity of this prototype vaccine using dose escalation and using these state-of-the-art methods to assess immunity. Um, finally, as is the case for many experimental medicine trials, this trial is uh, intended to inform the design of um, a vaccine that would be used for commercial development. At the same time, it informs the use of CMV as a platform for other uh, uh, disease indications. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anne. That was uh, really a tour de force. We really appreciate the, uh, the overview. And now we'll... Um, have our last speaker, Dr. Brett Leave, who's going to talk about the, va the value of experimental medicine studies for vaccine development. Thank you very much, Susan. And thank you to the, um, the National AIDS Society organizers for um, asking me to, uh, to speak. Um, going after uh, such a great set of speakers is always a challenge. And so I'm going to try to keep my remarks very brief. I was asked to offer um, the perspective of industry with, uh, with regard to experimental med experimental medicine um, trials and trial designs and their value in clinical development. So um, to that end, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm an infectious disease specialist. And prior to joining Moderna, I had worked in industry for more than a decade to develop vaccines to prevent a, and treat a variety of infectious diseases, including rabies, clostridioides, difficile, and influenza. The success of these projects was most often predicated on good collaborations between industry, government, and academic scientists. I joined Moderna in April 2020 to help them lead cl the clinical development of their SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, which was, leverage, which was leveraging a, a very long-standing collaboration between Moderna and, and NIH. The COVID-19 pandemic was an unprecedented opportunity to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of the messenger RNA vaccine platform. And the results exceeded our expectations, and the messenger RNA vaccines have provided the world with a powerful tool against the pandemic. The success was a further validation of the power of collaboration between industry, government, and academia, which I think has been reflected in the, the, the talks that we've heard um, uh, so far this morning or this afternoon. Moderna is committed to applying its mRNA platform to address other global health problems, and we are actively developing new vaccine, new, new medicines to prevent intractable infectious diseases and future pandemic threats. The platform allows for flexibility to target the location of the encoded protein that can be either secreted or membrane bound, as uh, Bill uh, mentioned earlier. Including sequences that encode for the viral capsid um, enable us uh, to generate a virus-like protein, um, which, is, uh, which is, is an example uh, by our, vac our Zika vaccine, which is in development. And that can offer strategic advantages when trying to focus the immune response on virus entry. In addition to our collaborations with IAVI, the Scripps Institute, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop um, a vaccine to prevent HIV infection, which date to 2016, we have expanded our efforts um, to prepare for future pandemics, including uh, a vaccine to prevent Zika virus infection, as I mentioned. And last year, uh, we announced a collaborative project with NIH to develop a vaccine to prevent Nipah virus infection. And we are, developing vaccines targeting other viral pathogens with very complex biological relationships with the human host, including cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus. So early translational research, uh, including clinical stage zero development um, studies uh, or experimental, med experimental medicine designs 
um, that um, Dr. Shattuck uh, described have great potential value for industry. The concept of exploratory clinical trials prior to traditional dose escalation studies to define safety and tolerability has actually been endorsed by the US FDA um, in guidance that was finalized in 2018. This approach to early stage development has heretofore been mostly applied to oncology, um, but considering the cost of drug development, um, these studies can provide early signals of benefit and risk that can inform program level decision making. In addition, since the pathophysiology of infectious diseases are the net result of the interplay between the immune system and the pathogen, uh, and these experimental medicine studies can help us tease these relationships apart. And an iterative, the iterative proof of concept studies that um, Dr. Sheaf and Dr. Naidu described today are illustrative of that. There's every reason to believe that these types of studies will play an important role in the development of vaccines, particularly those intended to treat challenging infectious diseases for the coming years. And that's my opening statement. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Brett. Um, so we're now gonna to turn to the panel discussion that's gonna be led by Dr. Nina Russell. So I'll turn it over to you, Nina. Thanks, Susan. Uh, it's really, uh, hello everybody. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate a discussion with this group of folks. And if everybody can come on screen and turn on their cameras, that would be great. Um, I think we're still seeing Susan very large here, but um, so there's lots to talk about here. The presentations, I think, did an outstanding job in outlining a broad array of issues. And I I'm gonna start and, and uh, try to stimulate some discussion about platforms. And, you know, we heard some very clear uh, descriptions of different platforms that are being utilized for these types of studies. Um, with the, some of the pros and cons around those. And um, for example, you know, Bill's, uh, Bill Sheaf's early studies were done with proteins. Robin has set up a system for rapid manufacture of proteins um, uh, outside of the US uh, with efforts to link those rapid manufacturing processes with fast clinical trials um, we heard from Anne about the CMV vector, um, and of course, mRNA is the, is the new kid on the block. Uh, and we as a field are um, benefiting from the fact that the COVID pandemic has de-risked the M mRNA platform in a very significant way. Um, so, and Robin, you did a beautiful job of outlining um, how, you know, this really ambitious 12 month cycle, which would be fantastic if we could actually realize it, which I think was really reliant on the types of timelines we, we get with mRNA. And so my question is, and we know protein takes longer, we know CMV takes longer. Um, my question is, is mRNA the only thing we have, the only tool we have in our toolbox right now for these types of studies, or are there other opportunities for platform plays? Um, and if we do all of this work with the mRNA platform, um, do we run the risk of not understand, of, of only evaluating these questions from one perspective, from that platform perspective? So maybe, um, maybe I'll put Brett on the spot first, since he's the mRNA guy, and uh, see what your thoughts are about, about this question. And then I'd like others to chime in. Um, well, I think the, uh, there, there are other uh, approaches, um, and I, I think uh, if I put aside uh, my, my messenger RNA hat for a moment, and, and I should say that my, my opinions now in this part of the talk are really my own, and they, they don't necessarily represent Moderna's. Um, um, you know, I think in response to the Ebola um, uh, uh, pandemic, um, uh, we learned an enormous amount and, and ultimately demonstrated the safety and uh, effectiveness of um, the vectored uh, vaccines. Um, and I do think that, uh, you know, in, 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 in response to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've also seen the value of those uh, there as well. And I, and I think they offer another approach um, to, uh, to the nucleic acid um, uh, uh, um, uh, platform. Um, 
and I'll you know I'll defer to my to maybe some other colleagues about the the value, the, the ability of, of the protein subunit um, uh, vaccines to to respond and to be used in this in this way. Robin, you've been the uh, the star of moving fast with proteins. You want to? Yeah, I mean, I think. That? I mean, I think RNA is it you know does hold promise because of the timelines. I think Bill made a, an important point in terms of you know it'll be very critical, for example, for you know the, the GT8 program to know whether RNA can do the same as protein, um, and if it can, that will be good. Um, and there are some other critical questions around RNA that we should answer soon to know whether it's, it's a useful tool. And uh, there's a difference in my mind between the tools to answer the pressing scientific questions and that how that when we get those answers, we make a product that is suitable for global use. And at the moment, we still haven't solved the questions around uh, how to make a vaccine that works, let alone a vaccine that we can produce. Um, if it requires proteins, that's still possible. It just requires more forward planning. If you can be making a, a protein with a 12 month cycle, you could be still churning out one every six months. You just need to plan further in advance and have a longer term strategy. Um, and, and obviously there are other technologies out there you know, RNA is good to a certain extent. It's still perhaps not so good for cellular responses. So if you were working on, you know, T cell responses against conserved epitopes for HIV, right now mRNA might not be on its own the tool that I would choose. Perhaps in a, you know, a, a hetero, heterologous prime boost combination, it might work better. So um, we need to be open to different approaches depending on the scientific question. Anybody else want to jump in here? I, yeah, hi Nina. Um, it's Jim Kublin. I think you know we've we've seen such transformative potential of the mRNA, but it, it was only three years ago that we were really focused on protein um, uh, products or or reagents for these experimental medicine trials. And at that time, you know, we were um, pushing immunogen classes, whether it be for the B cell lineage. <clears throat> or a structure-based epitope targeting design, or as Bill has, has highlighted, the germline targeting, and, and accomplished you know, at that time a lot of momentum and interest in moving forward with consistency of manufacturing and release, as has been discussed in the Q&A, that's critical to accelerate proteins, uh, for example, without requiring um, repeated tox for each platform manufacturing. Now with the mRNA, it's, it's really critical that we understand further the characteristics of these lipid nanoparticles and how the proteins are processed, such as secreted or membrane brown, bound, or even as, as viral-like particles, to understand those safety profiles that are going to be critical to really support the accelerated process of the experimental medicine approach. I think it's imperative we do really thoroughly understand both the release characteristics preclinically, but the clinical safety to support um, these experimental medicine studies. Yeah, I'd like to make Thanks. a comment. Oh, sorry. Can, Go ahead, yeah. I actually think that um, in line with what you're talking about here, some of the most important things that were said today, I think were Robin's comments on the timeline. Um, we're, you know, we're trying to go as quickly as we can, but there's, and everyone wants to, but, you know, he's showing that even if you go pretty quickly, it still could take a long time, uh, even if you're successful every time. And I think we need to think about where can we reduce the time in the clinical iteration. And I would, and, and I would say if in our experience, there are two places for sure that we, we, we could do some shrinking. So I'll just use G002 as an example. Um, we had a lot of people working on that to try to get it planned and get it launched even while G001 was still going. And I think everyone did a great job. We had, uh, we had safe to proceed from the FDA in July. And we have four sites, but actually at this moment, only one of them is up and running. And we've only enrolled two people. So in ways that's great, we're going, but 
um, it's still, that has taken a long time. And I think that for experimental medicine trials, if we have numerous people doing experimental medicine trials as we should as a field, and they wanna go quickly, we, especially in the time of COVID, we really need to think about the clinical, we need, I think we need a lot more sites probably, or we need dedicated investigators at those sites to make sure that we just go as quickly as we can. And we pick sites that will enroll for HIV studies. I mean, a lot of sites to say, you know, in our, in our city, people don't care about an HIV vaccine in the United States. They're just, you know, they're, they're not that interested or they're exhausted from the, from the COVID trials. So that's one issue like just speed of enrollment and speed of getting the stuff done. Because if you can't do it quickly, t Robin's timeline won't even hold, you know, so that, that's a problem. And then the other thing that Robin talked about was he had an example of six months for the readout. Um, now that is kind of dreamy if you're doing B cell sorting and sequencing and you're gonna get your readout with your statistics, um, you know, if you, if you can enroll your clinical trial, everybody on the first day, and you, then maybe you could do that, but still it's difficult. And I would just say, we've had the luxury, you know, cause we kind of started doing this a little bit first to be working with the VRC and working with the Fred Hutch where they have teams that already know how to do this and already can do it at scale and at the high level of quality needed for a human clinical trial. But if we're gonna have, we wanna do many of these kinds of studies. I don't think we have the bandwidth, you know, Adrian and Julie can't handle five trials at the same time while they're doing all the other stuff that they do, you know, and they're brilliant. They're, they're great at what they do. Um, so we need more teams to do that analysis and everybody needs more teams. You know, Rohir is doing a clinical trial. He's having the same teams do the analysis for his trial. So that everyone is bogged down with a very uh, restricted throughput. So I think the field as a whole, it's great what Ansuya said, we're adding capacity in Africa, and those teams are learning how to do that analysis. But I think the field as a whole needs to think about that. If we're going to go quick to try to make an HIV vaccine, or at least to find out if these sequential strategies will work, we need to accelerate the enrollment, and we need to accelerate the analysis. Yeah, so thanks for those comments, Bill. And I think there are, um, there are many issues here that we can unpack a little bit further, because the whole, I think our ambition as a field around experimental medicine trials is around speed of learning and speed being yeah. key and, and learning, uh, learning about the most important questions also being key. Um, so I wanna go back to the platform question for just one second before we move on to some of these other areas and ask related to this and related to the, um, the, the desire to do things in parallel, is there a world where we could evaluate multiple uh, platforms um, in comparison at the same time. So, so specifically, not all mRNAs are alike, and there, there are different flavors of RNA, and there are different ways, as was noted, of pre presenting immunogens using mRNA. And if we really wanted to understand that, we would potentially throw a bunch of them into a, you know, into a, a experimental medicine study at the same time, make them quick using you know, the same immunogen and put them into a clinical trial. Um, and so is there a universe where we could potentially do some experimental medicine studies, bringing in mRNAs from different developers and look at them in parallel in a single clinical trial or in a group of clinical trials? Well, I think, you know, I think that's the central rationale for the HIV vaccine trials network itself is to be able to conduct those comparative trials across platforms and developers. And I know you know, others such as Robin and Iavi have similar interests. Um, and the critical, uh, you know, push-pull that's necessary to bring the developers to the table for those uh, types of comparative, comparative trials is, is a critical um, initial step. And I think a critical one is, has been highlighted in, in the Q&A and others, how are these, proteins, the expression um, by mRNA within the host cell different from the expression of proteins in, in vitro, for example. And we don't have a direct comparison yet, but we're working on that. Is this something that industry would ever uh, be willing to participate in? Putting you on the spot again, Brett and Ann. <laughs> And do you want to do you want to go first, and I can go after you. Well, um, 
Yes, again, these are my opinions, but I, I think where we are with the CMV vector is very much at the early stage of understanding exactly what this vector will do and the T cell responses that we're aiming to induce. At this point, it would be challenging, let's say, to combine um, this platform with another one. That said, I think we can learn so much from one phase one study about the platform and I see that as being true for the other platforms too, that we learn about the platform, um, let's say at the level of uh, where is the protein expressed in this cell uh, as opposed to in vitro, similar kinds of questions that we all wanna talk about and certainly would endorse the fact that the HVTN creates that uh, ability to at least have um, some uniformity in the, the studies that are being done to assess the immune response. I, I would concur with, with what Ann said. And, and you know, we, Moderna is a platform company. Um, and so uh, I think the, the answer to that question really lies in what the, the scientific hypothesis is that you're trying to test. So if indeed it's a, it is a, a T cell response that you believe is driving the question, then the antigens should be designed appropriately to test that. And, and um, I think that would, that would be the best, the best way to, to respond uh, in, in that sort of situation. I mean, I, I'm concerned that a, that a bake-off of technology starts to slip into work as usual um, in terms of, yes, you know, HVTN is, is really the, the right place to do it and is a good place to do it. But often, actually, it's does the technology answer the question? It may not be best in class, but it may, may be best at answering the question. And if you're waiting for the bake-off between all the different RNA manufacturers, you're just delaying time. Um, and it's also it's important to recognize that the RNA we have today isn't the RNA tomorrow. I mean, what Moderna puts in their vaccine for the next candidate may be tweaked. It, technology doesn't stand still. So you, you have a bake off of today's technology and somebody comes in with something tomorrow that looks really important for HIV because it does something different. So right. let's not get sucked into the usual way of working and focus on the question. Is it good enough to answer the question? Then it gets, should go forward. Yeah, thanks for that, Robin. Um, uh, completely agree. And, and um, so, so let's pivot a bit, um, going back to this goal that we have of, around speed of learning. And um, Ansuya, you did a marvelous job of really outlining uh, what will happen with the G003 trial and all of the advantages and importance of doing these studies outside of the US. Um, and we've heard, you know, Bill just commented on the timelines for, for the G002 study. Um, and that's not just around site capacity, it's also around you know, regulatory um, issues come into play. And so I'd like to talk about um, opportunities. How do we balance the opportunities um, of doing some of these studies outside of the US with the need in some cases to do them within the US, um, both for um, practical reasons and um, uh, and, and because, for example, VTN has a relationship with the FDA. Um, uh, and and um, let's talk a little bit more about the opportunities there of working outside of the US. Um, uh, for example, the, the experimental medicine studies, you outline nicely some of the very complex um, procedures that are being done, FNAs, leukophoresis, and the capacity to do those in Africa. Um, and how do we ensure that we can, we can do these types of studies and do them quickly and have a rapid data generation cycle to then answer the question and start the next study? Um, do you think we can do these fast outside of the US? I think it's uh, this type of uh, study highlights something that's really important for us uh, within the work we're doing and that's collaboration, Nina. And really it is key to how we do these uh, projects. For example, in IRVG003, uh, we have partnerships with the Scripps Institute, with the IRV Neutralizing Antibody Center, with statistical teams from the VISC, all based in the US. And these guys have invo been involved from pre-recruitment uh, to set up, train, and get our local sites up to speed to start recruiting. 
to be honest, we do not foresee, um, well, I shouldn't uh, jump the gun, but we would hope that recruitment within our African sites would go at a good pace. Um, something that would stand in the way is what we discussed, the complicated procedures, leukophoresis in particular, and sometimes maybe large blood draws or fine needle aspiration. But again, we can try to mitigate these by doing community sensitization, doing individual education, and making sure that we are working with the teams on the ground to help people understand what they're getting involved in. And that will help us with the capacity and the uh, size of what we can do really in the future. Maybe related to that in terms of um, uh, engaging communities and making sure that we have the ability to enroll studies rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, Stacy, I wonder you know, if you could elaborate. We heard clearly from Robin that the risk benefit around these studies is different. Um, there's, there's not an immediate benefit to participants to participate in these studies. So what can we and should we be doing to really help communities understand these types of trials and engage communities to participate in them so that we can enroll people uh, quickly and also have our, our communities understand what we're doing? Um, sure, happy to, happy to kind of jump in on that. Um, and, you know, I think that we oftentimes sort of, I think just to kind of state from the outset in HIV vaccine research, there's been just such a strong history of um, of community engagement, right? So you've got communities that are kind of that have sort of rallied behind um, this type of research um, for 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 decades now, and um, and actually, you know, I would I would argue probably none of the, none of the trial volunteers have received a benefit, you know, so far. So I think we're not at that level. We're not really necessarily in in um, in such a such a different scenario around kind of engaging communities around these trials. I will say that I think this is a this is a kind of a a key time um, to kind of follow the the adage of you know kind of engage early and often and you always hear kind of engage communities from the outset and I think that this this is kind of the, the opportunity for that. Um, you know, these trials are going to be small, right? So, you know, they're, it's not like efficacy trials. We don't need to be, you know, going out and doing sort of, you know, kind of shouting on the street corner about experimental medicine. But I think a really important um, step right now might be to kind of pull together um, a group of sort of key, you know, kind of globally, a group of kind of key advocates or activists um, to kind of, you know, bring into the conversation sort of why experimental medicine, why now, um, you know, this conversation around um, how, are, how do we kind of have hope, I think, within the scientific community that this actually is going to accelerate the process and being able to kind of break that science down um, will be really important um, at, at that level. Um, you know, and I and and I think you know, kind of bring them in in a meaningful way, and not just sort of bring them in once, but maybe sort of develop some sort of a uh, a mechanism that this would be kind of a standing body to kind of help ad advise on this sort of experimental medicine as as a whole. Um, you know, this is not the group that's going to tell you which products to sort of put in your your experimental med medicine study, um, but these are the people that are going to be your champions. Uh, these are going to be your safeguards. Um, these are the people that have kind of access to uh, media and, um, you know, broader community and um, other stakeholders like policymakers and potentially, you know, even, even regulators in some cases. Um, so I think are, you know, are going to be really important, I think, when you, um, when you actually start to sort of engage. And as I'm hearing the discussion, I'm realizing that this, you know, you want to sort of really lay that groundwork if you want to do something like have a rolling kind of enrollment process and maybe sort of having a have a standing cohort of potential volunteers. I think um, you can't just sort of drop in and, and do that and expect, I think, the community to sort of jump on board with it. So um, I think the, the sooner the better. Thank you for that. Um, and so you, do you have any Anything you want to add to that before I move on to some closing questions? Just a small bit in terms of, we mustn't underestimate how much uh, the community as a whole or the world as a whole, anyone involved in clinical trials has been exposed to clinical trials over the last few years. Everybody is an expert and everybody is not an expert at the same time. Um, 
So when we're engaging with communities, we need to be aware of perceptions and uh, what people might have been exposed to within their specific countries, within their specific uh, communities, uh, with regards to vaccines and vaccines trials, and be sensitive when we uh, enter with our trials. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so there are a number of questions coming into the Q&A, which we won't have time to go through, but I encourage uh, you folks to look there and answer what you can um, uh, directly. Um, we only have about four or five more minutes, so I want to close with one question, which is that we've been talking about speed of learning and the, and the need to define clear hypotheses around these studies, and I think Bill's um, uh, EOD program is a great example of that. Um, so how do we, stepping back, um, do we need to, do, do we need to coordinate as a field around these studies? And if so, how do we do that? Um, do we need to define some specific hypotheses as a field so that we're not stepping on each other's toes and, and be um, proactive about identifying the constellation of studies that would need to be done to address those hypotheses? Or should we just let this be an organic thing and um, go its own way? Well, I, can, I think it should be somewhere between, I, if I could just comment on that question. Um, I don't think that a hyper-organized, uh, let's, let's have everyone coordinate and one person test each concept is correct because you know, we're not all that smart. We, we can't figure out who's is the best one to do one experiment or whatever, and different people are gonna do things different ways. So I think that, that wouldn't be good um, and it'd be too stifling. Um, but on the other hand, we probably shouldn't have it just be a wild west, uh, anyone who could manage to get funding, go do a clinical trial type of thing. So it's somewhere in the middle, uh, you know, make sure people have good hypotheses and they they have an appropriate readout. Um, but I do think that I, my, my thing, my thing, I think that we need a lot more sites like around the globe and just enroll a few people for each trial. Um, and you could wrap, it would be more like doing real experiments where you rapidly enroll and then you start doing your analysis um, rather so than waiting of, for enrollment. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but let me pause you on the readout question because there's coordination at the level of the readout. Um, yeah. That's essentially what BTN provides with their infrastructure is, is uh, you know, common readouts across all their clinical trials. But should we be trying as a field to, um, to coordinate and, uh, you know, cross-validate our, our readouts more than we are or to speed up? I mean, up. I think we have, you know, we have neutralization assays that are pretty well, people do a good job, I think, of cross-validating those and cross-checking, but it's going to be a while before, I think we're going to need a lot of B-cell sorting and sequencing, at least for the, for people trying to induce probably neutralizing antibodies and knowing if their strategies are getting there, it's going to be, we're going to need that readout um, yeah. And, and you know, do we need people to really cross validate strictly? I'm not sure, but we do need, I think we need numerous teams around the world that can do that um, assay and do it uh, rapidly and at high scale um, and get, you know, good answers basically. All right, so we have three yeah. hands up. So you guys have to give me some rapid fire responses here because we have to leave a few minutes at the end. So Anne, then Robin, then Jim. So I'll give a perspective from my own past work on varicella zoster vaccines and just point out that we shouldn't try to organize too well our readouts because different vaccine um, platforms work well for both, uh, you know, in both uh, uh, protein vaccine and live attenuated vaccine. The readouts for what may or may not correlate with protection are different. So we need to not become overly standardized in terms of um, thinking that there's only one vaccine platform, one design and one set of readouts. I would say that, you know, rather than using the term coordinate, which sounds controlling, what we really need is facilitators, whether that's people facilitating scientists to trial sites, or trial sites wanting to get involved in experimental medicine trials, 
or investigators with really important scientific concepts who don't know how to actually get them into the clinical clinical phase. And, and you know, the field is quite good at doing that for classical phase ones, and, and there are many examples. Uh, whether it's HVTN or CABD or European funded programs or African programs. Um, but what we haven't done is apply that to experimental medicine. And, and that's, it's more about focus and facilitation rather than coordination in, in my mind. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great word. Jim? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Robin and, and Anne's comments. I think, you know, it's, we, we really need to nonetheless ensure that the individual trials are articulating those clear hypotheses with regard to what that individual trial is going to contribute, what is success in that um, individual clinical trial, and what are the iterative next steps. And also to the, you know, to the building on the tremendous advances we've seen over the past two years and this societal momentum that we have an in interest in vaccines, we're really um, engaging many of the successful COVID-19 uh, vaccine sites to participate now in HVTN, the HIV vaccine trials, tremendous amount of interest to, to Bill's point to expand that capacity and footprint of clinical trial sites, not only domestically, but around the world. And also saw tremendous uh, advantages um, globally for these research registries in which we can um, engage participants, interested participants um, and volunteers um, from which each individual clinical trial site can then subsequently uh, recruit and enroll uh, into these trials. I think that's a, a, also a critical next step. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Stacy, I'm going to give you the last word and then I'm going to wrap us up. Okay, thanks a lot. I am um, just to say really quickly, I think um, on this issue of collaboration and co coming from the sort of the community or advocacy perspective, um, I mean, obviously defer to the scientists, but I think that there is going to um, be sort of a need to kind of assure communities that this is this is not the wild west. Um, this is not kind of a, a, a brand new sort of pivot for for the for the vaccine field. And just remembering that um, you know communities around the world have again kind of rallied behind this this effort for almost four four decades, and I think shouldered. Um, you know, a lot of really hard work and frankly, a lot of disappointment. Um, and, and, and so again, I think getting into the, you know, helping again, your sort of key community champions really understand um, what is kind of the new level of collaboration that's gonna happen with this sort of experimental medicine um, endeavor um, and how is it really gonna kind of accelerate, um, accelerate us to, the, to that end goal of an HIV vaccine. So thanks for the last one. So th that's great. Thank you. Thanks very much to all of you for, again, excellent talks and uh, excellent discussion. I think we've laid out some challenges for the field and for ourselves in terms of um, opportunities to move forward with these types of studies uh, and increase the speed of learning. So thanks again to everybody. And I'll hand it over now to uh, Elena or Susan. Susan, are you going to provide? And, and then I'll uh, hand it back to Elena. I just want to thank you again, all of the uh, panelists. This was really a fantastic discussion. You will be able to find this online. Uh, it will be posted, and you can see that in the uh, uh, in the chat function. Um, and I just want to close with a couple of uh, you know. It's I think that the the issues of speed, facilitation, clear hypotheses, and increasing capacity for both at both the clinical site level, as well as the laboratory and uh, statistical level um, is what we're really gonna need in order to move the field forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Elena now to close this out. I was just saying thanks again to all the participants for having joined us today, to our panelists, our speakers and, and our chart. Yes, mm, to share that you can find the recorded sessions on our website. I have sent the link in the chat. And we will also appreciate if you can spend some time filling the survey. We will really appreciate. So thanks once again. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And we hope we can see you again in our future webinars for Global Enterprise. Thanks.